but also I feel like that's like a good thing. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, let's uh, let's begin with an introduction by Professor Pastor. Okay, so this is uh, an honor and a joy. Uh, sorry, the origins of my. Um, fortunate acquaintance with our speaker's work came from my wife being so absorbed in a book that she wouldn't communicate with anyone. Uh, so administrator power, as, as they call her, uh, would respond in, in when one of our children or I uh, said anything, go away. And, but she was happy when she said it. She wasn't impatient. It was like, go away, I'm, I'm transported. And uh, then I finally got her attention, and she said she was reading a book by Jordan Schwartz called uh, Those Who Forget. And it was, and then she just had no words. She said, God. And then she said, you must read it too. And the word must had a kind of firmness and direction that sounded like the law was being laid down. And I thought a book about memory and horror, that's not like what I need right now. Um, but uh, the, the direction was clear. And starting the book, I too was uh, transported and entranced and thought, gosh. So the book is a transcendent achievement. And I'll say a little bit about why. Um, our speaker, Geraldine Schwartz, is a journalist, an author, and a documentary filmmaker. The book that you're about to hear a discussion of has won, I believe, 12 awards. And that's about a fifth as many as it deserves. And I believe in the fullness of time, uh, it will receive the uh, acclaim that uh, it's already well on the road to get it. Um, um, Schwartz studied history at the Sorbonne and at the London School of Economics. As the book uh, extremely powerfully specifies, uh, she is both French and German. Uh, she joined in 1997 the Paris Jour Journal School Centre des Formations. A journaliste, Barry, and I am showing off my French accent here, <laughs> and then worked at Bloomberg News and became a correspondent for, correspondent for Agence France uh, Press in Berlin. She's now, as noted, working in Berlin and making films as well as writing. Um, two thoughts about what you're about to hear. You're about to hear from people who will have much more clarity than I. Uh, the first is the author's statement, which is, the most dangerous monster is not a megalomaniacal and violent leader, but us, the people who make him possible, who give him the power to lead. That kind of cries out in detail from the book. And the thought, second thought is, I found one of the most powerful moments in the book. Uh, Charles de Gaulle, who's described in the book as uh, giving a, a rosy and inaccurate conception of how the French people uh, responded to the occupation under him. That de Gaulle's account was um, not truthful. And de Gaulle said at one point, in response to the mounting clarity about what actually happened, uh, what the French people need is not truth, but hope, which is an extremely powerful uh, account of one understanding of how to deal with um, history. Uh, the book, which is about memory and horror and memory work, achieves something which is um, I think not achievable really, which is to leave the reader with a sense of inspiration and uh, something, I'm groping for words, uh, something uh, elevating as well as deeply you know, moving about what human beings can do to one another. And my thought last night was, 
how did she do that? And I think the way she did that is she answered the call. What people need is truth and hope. We're very fortunate to have her here. So we'll do a 10 minutes to uh, 15 minutes presentation uh, from Geraldine, and then uh, we'll open up the space for conversations. I have a lot more questions than than what you know uh, than than uh, it will take us an hour and a half or more to <coughs> go through. But we'll open it up so that um, I'll I'll have an opportunity to ask her some questions, but then you will uh, as well. But if you don't, I have more questions to ask. So let, let's open it up and um, and please welcome. Um, so I have not actually a presentation ready, I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, maybe just starting uh, with why I decided to write this book. Um, so first actually I wanted to write a political book and not a personal book. This is a personal story, it's my family story. But in 2017 I thought I would like to make a contribution to memory work in Europe. Uh, you know, um, the European Union was founded on memory, uh, on memory of wars, of uh, the Holocaust, and of uh, totalitarianism. Um, it's the big main difference with the United States, you know, the dream of Europe is to share the same history, and the dream of uh, the United States, I believe is uh, to erase the past of each other so uh, everybody can share a similar future. Um, but for Europe, uh, this idea of sharing the same history is, uh, you know, laid the foundations of the European Union. And because of the uh, growing threat of populist parties in Europe, um, especially in France nowadays, uh, but back then also in Germany in 2017, for the first time, a far-right uh, nationalist party entered the parliament, the Bundestag. This was the first time since the end of World War II. Um, and I thought, what is, um, you know, are we going, are we, are we about to forget? Are we about to forget about this, this past, which um, lays the foundation of uh, the world uh, we're living in? Um, so I decided to write um, a contribution to this memory work. But of course, if you write a book about memory work and you are about to criticize uh, countries uh, which haven't done this work, you have to do your own work yourself. Uh, the work of your own family story. So I started to um, question two witnesses of uh, my grandparents, uh, which are my aunt and uh, my father. My father was German, um, and um, he was born in 43. And he's part of a generation who, after the war, beginning in the late 50s and 60s, started to question their own parents about what they did during the war. Uh, so my father was very happy to uh, collaborate with me by uh, writing this book. And um, he told me a few things about his own father, um, that his own father was part, a member of the Nazi party in the 30s, but that he wasn't a convinced Nazi. He was more a Nazi out of opportunism. Um, but what he didn't tell me, uh, and what I discovered myself by uh, uh, searching into the center of our family house in southwest uh, Germany, um, is that in 1938, my grandfather bought a company from a Jewish family. That means that um, he took advantage of uh, anti-Semitic Nazi policy um, to make, you know, to, to buy a business for a very low price. This is actually, I mean, the company was a small company. 
this kind this kind of attitude was quite ordinary at that time in the 30s in Germany. So I thought this is like a, a banal story. Who, which reader will be uh, interested with such an ordinary story? Because most of the Germans, uh, you know, supported the Nazi regime or took advantage uh, from, from it. But it is precisely because it is a very banal attitude that um, I thought it might interest the readers. Because it shows the attitude of uh, most of the Germans during, under the Third Reich. Most of the Germans were not perpetrators. Uh, they were not victims and, and not heroes. Um, they were what I call um, Mitläufer. So those who follow the current. There is no word for that in, in English, which I find interesting because that means maybe that there wasn't uh, a reflection in American society about this <coughs> phenomenon of uh, being responsible for consolidating a criminal state just by following the carrot. There are only, as far as now, I've only found two countries who have a similar term. It's uh, Sweden and uh, the Netherlands. But uh, France also doesn't have um, a term like that. And in our collective memory of war and dictatorships in Europe, we tend to divide the attitude of, uh, of society into um, three categories, which is perpetrator, heroes, or victims. And we forget about this <coughs> category of midwifer, which is actually very important because it's the major, one of the major actor. And I think maybe the reason why is um, because it's, um, it's not a spectacular attitude. And also in fiction, fiction contributed very much to uh, this uh, uh, ob ob obliviousness, no, ob obliviousness of midlife. Because it's, it's difficult, you know, to write a novel or to make a film about this figure, which is in a gray zone, uh, it's, it's indefinite. Um, however, I think that it is difficult to learn from history without acknowledging this actor. Because uh, you cannot really identify with perpetrators, with monsters, you know? As a, as a citizen, you cannot imagine being Dr. Mengele or, uh, you know, uh, uh, throwing babies against the wall to kill them uh, like some Nazis did in extermination camps. But you can imagine being my grandfather. You can imagine that out of opportunism, you might become accomplice of a criminal regime. Uh, especially if you can buy, you know, a company for a cheap price or a flat, a nice flat for a cheap price. Um, and so the reflection about this figure of the Mitläufer is very central um, in order to learn from history. It sends us back, I think, to our own uh, responsibilities and uh, contradictions today. Uh, so it is a family book, but the family is an alibi to talk about this uh, this figure of midwife too. Um, let me let me take the baton from there, okay. um, <laughs> and that's really what I liked. Um, first, first I have to say you know, thank you for writing this book, and con congratulations for being able to pull off something that I thought was interesting. And in it is that you not only transported and transfixed. I'll say, me as a reader, but what I found was that it was a personal account. It was, by all accounts, you know, when you think about history, you're thinking about the big picture, what happened, <clears throat> the numbers, the economy. But this was a personal story, a personal story of one person, of one family, and uh, that story is told very well 
and it's not the the story of history. It's it's uh, it's not you know heroes or villains. It's it's not big characters. It's just one regular family. Uh, but in telling that story, you you're also able to tell not just the the, the history of Germany from the, the, the First World War, and especially the Second World War, but you're able to tell these. Uh, universal human phenomena. And that is really where I was able to relate to the book. Although I grew up in Ethiopia, um, in, in, in Eastern Africa, Ethiopia, and in, in part in Somalia, um, 70 years after the events you described. And I could still relate to what you're writing. And, and what you're writing, the conclusions, the lessons are still relevant. That is really what I found uh, the book uh, what, what I found fascinating about the book. Uh, my first question uh, relates to memory. And memory in the sense of also something that, one of the things that I really related to, uh, one of the stories I related to is in the ninth chapter, where you describe in a very warm, vivid detail um, the ornate furniture in your grandparents' house. Um, you say you know, furniture that's reeking of grand bourgeoisie. Um, and that personal space that you grew up in, you later found out is, is property and furniture that was bought at auctions of uh, uh, individuals that were either fleeing or that would later perish. And in, in that description, you also tell how you know, the, the fleeing, the, the fleeing uh, victims in this context were sometimes in the same room where, where their objects, personal objects, were being sold off in auction. So that there's something very personal about it. Um, but then, you know, how does one um, how does one how does one justify to themselves? Because this experience that that I read, if you've ever been to um, the house of a deceased family member. You have this, you know, feeling where there's like this heavy presence. That's what I felt uh, reading through that chapter. Uh, and my first question is, how wh how does one function as a midwifer? How does one forget in that moment, in that personal moment, forget that what they're doing is wrong? Um, thank you very much. Um, well, first, yes, the, the midlifer figure, I have to add, is not a German figure. It's not only existing under the Third Reich, it's universal and timeless. So this is why I'm happy you, you could relate to it. But um, the, the chapter uh, you mentioned, I don't know if uh, you've, you've read this chapter, but maybe I just um, can describe a little bit. My father... Um, discovered uh, in the 60s by watching pictures of his parents' flat from before the war, that the furniture was different before the war and after the war, I mean, and during the war. Um, and so he had, we don't have a confirmation, but he suspects his parents uh, to have bought this, this furniture during auction. Um, and um, auction which were selling Jewish good during the war. And I found out later that most, many auctions took place in the flats uh, left by the Jews when they were deported, so that the people who went to this, to this auction knew who, um, who these uh, belongings uh, uh, had, uh, had, I mean, uh, where, 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 who were the proprietor, proprietor, who were the owners of these belongings? Many times it was in the same district. So it might have been people they had known themselves, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, the pharmacist or the doctor uh, next door or the neighbors, maybe former friends. Uh, and that really shocked me because I thought um, many Midläufer in Germany were Midläufer out of blindness. 
And sometimes it's easy. If you don't want to understand what's going on, if you want to blind yourself, it's not that difficult. But you, when you go in the flat of a neighbor who you had known, who was deported, and you buy his belongings, uh, you cannot pretend to be blind anymore. And also, it, um, it, can, it, 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 it makes one excuse of the Germans after the war uh, totally invalid, and this excuse was that they didn't know. Of course, most of the Germans didn't know that the Jews were deported in extermination camps and that were gassed. But if you buy belongings from Jews uh, in a flat that they have just left, that means that you don't expect them to return. So I thought this is a very important uh, uh, point. Um, so the forgetting about in that moment, you know, uh, forgetting that you are contributing to a criminal state, I think this is very easy because if you take advantage, first you take advantage of uh, the despair of a community. Um, so you are, uh, you, you, the advantage, you know, I mean, the, the Third Reich was very clever in understanding that you cannot convince the people just by <coughs> ideology or by anti-Semitic ide anti -Semitic ideology. You have to offer something more. And what they offered was you can take advantage from the despair of this community. So that many Germans took advantage, even in, uh, you know, in, in, in universities. Uh, university professors um, could have refused to take the job of a Jewish colleague who got fired. But most of them didn't refuse. They took the job. You know, it was an opportunity for their career. And you had these kind of examples in many, many, many different fields. Uh, and this is how uh, the Third Reich convinced also many Germans to become anti-Semitic. Um, but after the war, how you forget about your responsibility as a Litwaifer after the war, uh, this is what happened to my grandfather, because the second part of the story tells how I find a letter from my grandfather who writes to the only survivor of this Jewish uh, company, this company he built from a Jewish family, uh, who demanded reparations after the war. And my grandfather responded, he refused to pay reparations, and he left copies of his own letters. And in this letter, you can see that he's in total denial of his responsibility as a Mitläufer uh, during the Third Reich. And most of German society after the war was in total denial of their responsibility to a point that they considered themselves as victims. Um, okay, so let me take you uh, from the past to the present. Um, and, and what are the lessons that we could take for the present? And especially in the context where um, war has come back to Europe. Is that because we have not learned our lesson um, and therefore you know, doomed to repeat history? Or am I reading this wrong and, and we did learn from the lesson, this is just an aberration? Um, well, so um, obviously barbarism is back to Europe. Um, and one of the reasons, in my opinion, of that is that a political leader, Vladimir Putin, uh, is um, unable to come to terms with the past. Uh, he sees uh, himself invested with a mission, the mission to rehabilitate um, the glory of uh, the Russian history. Um, he feels that Russia was uh, humiliated by Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union. So he rewrites history, he uh, polishes it, he erases the shadows, and um, he, start, he tries you know, to give an only positive image of, uh, of, of, his, of his country. And this, by doing this, he doesn't only um, try to 
glorify national identity, but he also uses history as a weapon of mass destruction. So he's, he uses um, history to justify imperialistic uh, violence. I mean, nowadays in, in Russia, um, history is distorted everywhere. Uh, at schools, in the museums, uh, in the media, in, the, in, in fiction, in the films. And there is even a law that stipulates that the, the state uh, guarantees uh, the protection of uh, historical truth. But on the other side, what is interesting is the reaction of the Europeans, um, because um, actually the war unified the Europeans. The Europeans are always divided, they always fight, they never, you know, it's very hard for Europeans to, uh, to, to take decisions because um, of these divisions. But on that point precisely, the Europeans were very unified. Um, and this is the positive message of this war, that maybe the Europeans did learn something from history. So that they, they, didn't, they don't allow themselves to be divided anymore. And um, people have um, you know, now the taste of, know the taste of uh, liberty, uh, of freedom, of peace, and um, maybe now they know that no ideology, no imperialism is worth uh, sacrificing peace and freedom, and that no history is worth uh, dying for. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so <clears throat> you know, stretching from uh, what's happening with you know, history telling in Russia to what you described in Germany. Um, you know what are the what are the lessons that are in the middle? History uh, coming to terms of with history done wrong is an example uh, of what's happening in Russia. Um, what are the other alternatives that that are in the middle that are you know not necessarily leading to war but leading to the, uh, uh, not preventing the fetishization of history or the grandeur of history. You mean the Germans fetishize history? Um, no, it, it, <laughs> it? I'm making reference to the rise in, for example, uh, far right thinking mm -hmm. all over Europe. And we can also bring this conversation to the US, but let's see you know, first. Uh, yes. in so, in terms of learning from history, what are the different lessons you could draw out? Mm -hmm. Well, first, I mean, there is a difference between Germany and other states. Uh, you know, for obvious reasons, Germany really uh, made this effort to come to terms with the past. Uh, and um, I would say one key of the success of uh, memory work in Germany is that they, the Germans, did put the Mittläufer figure in the center of their remembrance culture. This was possible because uh, the claim to do this memory work came from society. It was not imposed from on high. Um, and second, the question which uh, uh, rose was more how could this happen than what did happen? And this is a big difference. So German society, it took a long time after a scandalous impunity. But uh, beginning in the late 60s, society started to question itself. The whole of society, I mean, not the uh, uh, generation of my grandparents. You don't do memory work. I mean, the memory work was not for the generation of my grandparents, but for the young generation. And so the, the, this young generation, the whole society, start to question itself. Um, and to, the, the main question was, how do you become an accomplice of a criminal ideology, of a criminal regime? Out of opportunism, like my grandfather, out of blindness, like my grandmother. She was also a Nazi. 
Um, but she admired Hitler. You know, she, she was an admirer of Hitler. Uh, she was totally blind. She didn't have any political education, I must add. Um, out of cowardice, out of conformism, you know, most of the time, I also read this in your article, you meant, what is the, 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 the terminology you use uh, um, when you conform to, 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 the, to social norms, even if you think differently? Um, this is very powerful conformism. Um, so, uh, in, in German society, at some point, moral got inverted. <coughs> so, evil, what was evil yesterday started to be good, and what was good started to be evil. And this is, I think, the main, the, the, the main thing you can, you can learn from reflecting about this history, is to know yourself better. Uh, to know that you can fail. <laughs> that sounds a bit positive, negative, but it's, it's indispensable to be in a democracy as a um, citizen who has actually the power to change something through his vote. You have to be aware that you can fail. And um, this, uh, reflecting about this history, to the point of view of the Mitläufer, allows you to reflect about your own failure. Um, and I think this is very powerful in Germany until now. I don't know, I mean, Germany is not immune, but I, until now, the far right party is, you know, limited. It has uh, more or less 10% of the votes. It had 10% of the votes at the last um, election. It's much less than in many other countries in Europe. Uh, especially in France, where at the last election, the far-right party got more than 40% of the votes. In Italy, we can call it a neo-fascist party, uh, is uh, ruling the country right now. Right now, In Spain, the far-right party is also very powerful. And these are all countries uh, who um, either have dealt with their past, like Italy and Spain, or in France it's a bit different, the memory work has been done, but the midwife is not at the center. The tendency in France uh, would be to blame the leaders. So in, the French are ashamed of having this history of collaborating with the Third Reich, but they're blaming the leaders. And there is not, nothing like a reflection on the attitude of French society uh, under, under collaboration. And so many countries have missed the opportunity um, to strengthen their democracy or the awareness for democratic responsibility among their citizens by doing this level of work. Okay, um, let, let me also open it up. Um, to the audience, but I have one more question maybe that I'll pose and then open it up. Um, so one of the things that, that I felt reading through this book was um, I was also seeing what my role is since Ethiopia is going to, through a similar unraveling currently. Um, it's, it forced me to ask what I've done, what I could have done, and what kinds of you know what kinds of similarities there are that I could learn from uh, from this book, and I'm wondering. Let me ask the question as I'm wondering how some of the descriptions you have of um, the Nazi regime testing the people out with different you know provocations, small things, uh, whether whether the Publics in, in the U.S. especially, how they have reacted to, you know, children in cages and things like that. Uh, but let me, before coming to you, let me open it up to the audience and. and um, <clears throat> I just had a question around uh, this idea of memory work and, and maybe just challenging uh, um, the notion of, of Germany having done that work because it sounds like you're referring to West Germany. And we're in, in Ostdeutschland, where that, that is where I think the IFD is really consolidating its power. And, um, spent, uh, I've spent a lot of time in, in Brandenburg and in the like mm -hmm. former DDR and, and you know, 
helpful to a lot of, um, I guess, residents there. But I, um, I don't know where, where I'm trying to locate my question. It's just how, how do you think that kind of complicates this idea of like the memory work having been done? And I think um, the same in Italy and in Spain, it's usually kind of regions that feel more economically disenfranchised, right? So there's, um, there's kind of more to the picture. And then I think, uh, does that make any sense? I think maybe if you could just speak to the um, East and West in mm -hmm. Germany kind of picture and then how state formation might um, have, like, post-DDR, like, how memory work has been kind of done in those regions and maybe why the riot has kind of come to come to power in those regions. Um, and I, I, I think I would disagree in terms of they actually do have a lot of agency within, um, you know, for the um, north, uh, northeast and, and within eastern Germany. That was a bit of a muddle. It wasn't really a question. I'm just trying to form a question. But yeah. Oh, there are many questions there. Uh, yeah. Maybe let's focus on west and east Germany. Mm. That's um, uh, very interesting because I'm, you, you're right. When I said Germany, actually, I think west Germany. Mm. Uh, you know, West Germany built its democracy on memory work. You, you cannot uh, divide those. And in East Germany, there was also memory work. I mean, East Germany was founded on the myth that it was the country of um, the communist Germans who had fought the Nazis on the side of the Soviet Union. And that was maybe true for the leaders. Uh, the leaders had been communists on the Third Reich, many were sent in concentration camps, but the people were the same than in the West. I mean, they were, so there was nothing like the West and East. They were Mitläufer. So the regime had to um, uh, infiltrate society with anti-fascism, you know, in an artificial way. So there were many commemorations, you know, starting at school, at the... Uh, little children would start, you know, the school day with an anti-fascist commemoration. Uh, but uh, the difference, uh, the key difference is that the East Germans identified themselves with the victims, all the heroes, with the communists, and not with the perpetrators, not with the Mitläufer. So, um, uh, in, in, in the West, starting in the 60s, 70s, society really uh, it identified, accepted that uh, they had played a role in the Nazi crimes. Um, so this is one of the reasons, but not only, but for me it is one of the reasons why democracy is not that uh, well anchored in the East. It is also a much younger democracy. You know, when, when did the wolf fall 30 years ago? 30 years ago. Uh, <laughs> Um, but of course, uh, because there haven't, hasn't been this reflection on Mitläufer tomb, on responsibility, uh, I think the, the awareness of your duties in a democracy uh, is, uh, is less spread in the East. But when I'm talking about the East, it's really the region, the East, because many Germans coming from the East, young German coming from the East, living in the West, they are educated like the West Germans. And there is an intergenerational rapture there between the younger East Germans when they come back to their homes in East Germany. They don't get on with their parents anymore who have been educated under a dictatorship. And one third of the people vote for the far right party, AFD. Um, in, um, and it's, it's a very difficult, it's really challenging for, uh, for, for Germany because, you know, Germany in the West has a similar interpretation of the past and it allows them to have this, what we name a collective memory. But this collective memory is not really shared by part of the Eastern uh, Germans. Um, the best problem is even uh, worse in Spain. There is nothing like a collective memory in Spain because the population is really very strongly divided after Franco's death in the 70s. Um, the parliament passed a law which was a kind of law of forgetting, you know. 
they, even the social democrats, passed this law, voted for this law, because they thought to build the country, to build the, a new country, a democracy, we need a unified society, and we cannot have a unified society based on the divisions of the past. And this was may, maybe, uh, back at that time, um, the better answer, but now, 50 years later, you know, in Spain, no memory work has been done, and society is more divided than ever. Uh, the case of Italy is the most surprising one, because Italy is the country was, where fascism was born. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it was the first allied of Germany, you know, ideologically and, and on a military level. And um, I don't know if you know the older Primo Levi, uh, survivor of Auschwitz, um, who said in, the, in an interview in the late 70s that Italy is hiding behind the atrocities of the Nazis. And so in Europe, because uh, the atrocities of the Nazis were unbeatable, mm -hmm. and because the Germans started to this memory work, many other countries you know, tried to hide behind these atrocities to avoid to make their own memory work. And this is what happened um, with Italy. Yeah, let's take three questions. And then, uh, well, just, just a very uh, quick point, and Mitlaf, uh, we might say, go with the flow. Uh, in, in the yes. um, I agree with you that um, the masses have to look to what their, their responsibility is. This is very good. I caution you, though, at the beginning, you talked about the banality of it. Uh, I think we have Hannah Annette to uh, blame for that, and as the recent iPhone tapes have shown, there was not simple, I'll go with whatever orders I have, deep-rooted belief in what, in what they were saying. And I think many of these midlaughters um, over centuries have been conditioned to believe what, the, what Hitler was producing uh, for them. And further evidence, you talked about your grandfather not wanting to make reparations for this small business. Countries have passed laws, and this is good to say in the law school, that you can buy, you can effectively buy something that has a defective title, and then you have it. And so they have refused, even the museums have refused the restorations. So I think a lot of work still has, has to be done. And with respect to Italy, the newly released Vatican archives might, might, might be very interesting to put into your considerations. Um, how, sorry, how do you reconcile the difficult question of accountability versus reconciliation? And oftentimes, you know, if you're failing to hold somebody accountable for the sake of reconciliation, you might be losing one or the other. And how do you, do you think there are different times for these things? How do you think they interact? And, and what... Is, is there a certain way to tell when one's appropriate versus the other when you sort of need to just hold somebody accountable even if you're continuing to have like inner societal tensions in a way that can be resolved? Um, thank you for your remarks and, uh, and your writing. I wondered how you felt you could define, if you could define, the differences between the mid loafer and this historical experience of Nazism in comparison, say, with two countries roundly described as democratic. The first is the United States. So we talk a lot about the Trump election. Uh, we had millions of people who could, could come very close to fitting into the middle of her. Um, I remember interviews that were television by the barrel of elderly and not very knowledgeable ladies, particularly in the period where they were not very well educated, believing completely in the big lie and hence enthusiastically supporting Trump. Were they simply going along with the majority of their communities? Were they quiet accomplices, which maybe is some bad English equivalent of, uh, of Mitt Lothar? 
because they were certainly vital to Trump's success and maybe future success, just as much as the middling German who did not protest and thought Germany will become great again, all was responsible for, as you say, Hitler's. So I wonder how though you compare the many, the high percentage of Trump supporters who simply believe one or another version of the big lie and make possible through the vote the democratic key instrument of showing we're a democracy. And even in Israel, the present threats to the Constitution, the people who are supporting the coalition, the reigning right-wing coalition, Israel has done very well economically and technically. Is this a feeling of, hey, he must have, this has to be a good government, and hence there can't be anything wrong with amending our non-constitution in certain ways. What are the differences or similarities between these kinds of support for what are? Uh, just one quick thing, when I was a student at the college or at the law school years and years and years and years ago, I could go on with years, um, uh, not, none of what roils America today, none of the contentious disputes that lead to efforts to block certain kinds of education or certain kinds of reading um, were about because there was nothing to block. I don't think see three syllables, a slight exaggeration, were pronounced about the matters which so perplex us today. I knew so little about slavery, for example. I knew so little about the profound, rooted, deeply embedded inequalities in American life which made most of the country blind to me being educated at an elite university. Is that at all similar? Burying the past or reifying certain elements of the past to permit a present to ignore that and hence march ahead as if it's all on the achievement side. So those are my questions. Any questions? Um, yeah, just, uh, Let me go and then I'll, I have a question for you. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, well, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure I remember everything, but the first um, a comment um, about banality. I mean, you, you cannot compare Eichmann and my grandfather, you know. <laughs> I wasn't doing so, that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I totally agree that Eichmann was, it was not banal and uh, he was very much convinced and uh, many of the key uh, perpetrator were uh, um, convinced and, but in the case of my grandfather, uh, I think um, it is, it was ordinary in the sense that uh, um, it's the way many Germans thought at that time, you know. Um, and I think maybe a, a, an, impor an important point is that in, the, in his letters after the war, my grandfather defends himself by saying that it was legal, <laughs> being in the law school, mm -hmm. and then he, he acted legally. So it is true that one uh, good, you know, trick of the Nazis was to make, legalize crime. And because the Germans were historically very attached to laws, uh, for them maybe what was important was that they had the feeling that the state of law was still existing, and uh, this is what you know the Nuremberg, law, Nuremberg laws in '35. Why would a criminal regime uh, 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 make this effort to make laws to justify the crimes? Because in a way, it helped people to become accomplice, having the feeling that they were doing it uh, within a legal framework. Um, your question about reconciliation and accountability, um, well, that's a good question. I have never really thought of making a difference between both of them, but um, of course, for me, accountab accountability comes, comes first. I think you cannot, uh, you know, make this work in a culture of guilt. Not anymore. Of course, my father, he felt guilty and his generation when they started to, um, to make this memory work. But now my generation, the next generation, 
or even in the United States, I think regarding now the slavery parts, um, this work should not be done in a culture of guilt. It should not be instrumentalized to stir up revanchism, to stir up sectarianism. It should not threaten freedom of speech. But still, on the state level, I think the first step is to apologize. So taking up accountability would be to apologize because the state is, you know, is the continuation of the former criminal state. So this is very important to give an example, so that society might then make the effort of reflecting about the crimes of the past. Um, but um, uh, you know, to take the perspective of the victim. Um, but then it is important also to overcome the dialectic victim versus perpetrator, uh, which is was well, easier in Germany than now it is in the United States because many victims were dead and gone, you know? So, um, um, the, the, the dialectic victim's perpetrator is a kind of uh, a deadlock. The reconciliation step, the reconciliation, I think, uh, implies also a part of forgetting. Not only forgiving, but forgetting. So forgetting and remembering goes hand in hand. You know, I can take as an example the French-German reconciliation. So first there was the apology from Germany, and then the reconciliation, um, which was partly based on forgetting. Winston Churchill in '46, you know, asked the Europeans to forget. He thought that, you know, uh, uh, his plea would help um, preserve peace. But the French-German reconciliation was more based on remembering than on forgetting. Remembering together. Um, and this is what's what's all about. Memory work should be a process which allows an intercultural dialogue, you know, um, and not, uh, uh, and not, of course, confronting uh, each other. I don't know if I answered your question, but, uh, but the, this, this still, still, if there is no culture of guilt, there should be a culture of, of a responsibility. Or for a young generation who cannot be um, uh, held respons guilty for what happened 100 or 200, 200 years ago, they still have a responsibility. They still have the duty to remember. Um, and this is maybe the difference I make between responsibility and, uh, and guilty. And just to, to end, um, this is a thought I had more recently, that shame is not only negative. Because in France, I would say in the last 10 years, this um, um, memory work is, has, has faded a little bit. You know, the new generations are not interested anymore in this past distant history. Um, and I think I relate this to the rise of hatred speeches, of far right parties. Uh, and shame protects us from the worst. And in Germany, the fact that there is still this shame is very healthy. <laughs> it protects the Germans. <laughs> from the worst. Oh my God, the Israeli, <laughs> this is a big question. Similarities, and I could write an essay on it. Uh, you should. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, there are so many differences. I mean, the similarity is just that um, uh, the, you know, the midwifer is not only America, it's, it's it's everywhere, yes. and it's not only related to politics, it's also related to the way we consume. You know? mm -hmm. uh, when we buy a t-shirt uh, from Vietnam, uh, we can imagine that maybe you know, there's child work involved. It's the same for uh, climate change. You know? mm -hmm. How often do we take the plane when we know actually, I mean, we have such a suicidal attitude. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so it's 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 really. I think all of us are midwifers. 
Mm -hmm. And what is very important to reflect about is that it's better to prevent uh, than to cure in any case. When I think of my grandparents, um, you know, in the 30s, they were not politically educated. But nowadays, when you live in a democracy and you have, you know, you have uh, access to all kind of information, and you you can be educated, even if you go no, don't go to Harvard, you can be educated, uh, and you still uh, think this lies, believe this lies, you're still very susceptible to all these manipulation techniques. This is something that really frightens me. Um, but here again, I think through memory work, you can really uh, learn to be vigilant. I mean, when memory fades, village vigilance fades. And the example of the past, the experience of our ancestors, you know, just, just uh, can make you smarter. And I just, I just believe that um, most of the people who are uh, uh, who vote. For Voted for Trump. Once I understand that many people are disoriented, so that maybe the future is uncertain. So let's look at the past because it's the only thing which we have certain is the past, and these are important benchmarks to guide us to shape uh, our present and future. <laughs> we have time just for one more. No, I thought that was fantastic. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. Thank you.